we got there, Alan was talking at the beginning and he said, ancient of days, as old as you are, you will never change. Folks, let's see if you can sing along with this or play along with this. It's really very simple. But again, if it's not in your genre, don't sweat it. But as soon as he said that, I was just so delighted because we're talking about or we're about to talk about familiar spirits and then the utterance that came from the man of God was ancient of days as old as you are and it reminds me of a song that we used to sing ancient of days as old as you are as old as you are you will never change ancient of days as old as you are as old as you are you will never change it may not sound like any one of the songs you've ever heard and it's okay because it might have originally been in a different language, but that's what it translates to in English. Ancient of days, as old as you are, you will never change. You see, let's just sing that song one more time and by the time we get into today's teaching, it will make more sense. Are we ready? Ancient of days, as old as you are, as old as you are, you will never change. Sing ancient of days, ancient of days, as old, as old as you are, as old as you are, you will never change. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because those gods want to be like you. They want to mimic your permanence. They want to take on the similitude of your integrity and faithfulness. But we know that no matter how much they try to come and be familiar with us, nobody can ever take your place in our hearts because we know that you are the only one that was, is, and is to come. And as old as you are, as old as you are, you will never change ancient of days as old as you are as old as you are one more time you will never change father in jesus name we thank you because you will never change and we can rely on you May we continue to recognize your voice and not be misled by the ones who disguise themselves as angels of light. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Let us all be seated. God is good. Actually, if you haven't sat down just yet, stay standing. And if you want to get up again, stand up. I want us to read Matthew chapter 17, verse 11. Anybody notice that since brother Matthew came back, we've been reading Matthew quite a bit. Oh yeah. So if, you, if you're wondering where we're at, for some of you, you've been pinging in the spirit because this month morning, my wife, this is what my wife woke me up with. She said, I really think we need to know exactly what time it is. You know, it is important to know the season, but it's very critical to know the time that we're in. And you know, every now and again, the Holy Spirit will lead me to tell you what time we're at. And in the last 18 months, actually in the last two years, I've been telling you the time by scriptures. Remember when we were at Luke 17, when we progressed to Luke 20, 21, Matthew 24. But now we are in Isaiah 43. So if you just want to get a good grasp of where we're at, simply because everything that unfolds has been penned down by God. Everything's been written. And that is the reason why Jesus began his ministry with it is written and he ended his ministry with it is written. You understand what I mean? What do I mean? 
when his ministry began, Satan came to tempt him and the very first words that came out of his mouth was, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And when Jesus was on the cross, or he was about to go to the cross, his ministry had ended. You know, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, such that he went about doing good, healing all manners of sicknesses. And so all that ministry of going to heal people and all of that came to a close right at the gates of the Garden of Gethsemane. And what did he say? He said, behold, the Son of Man is going as it's been written of him in the volume of the books. So one of the things that we have come to know is that as believers, our lives and our ministry should be guided by the written word of God. We need to operate by the spoken word of God, but we need to get ourselves absolutely familiar with the written word. And so what God's been doing with us is this. He's been helping us get a good grasp of where we're at by showing us what has already been written. You know, when David was on the courts of heaven, he was wandering around just having a good time. And then he stumbled upon the volume of the books wherein his entire life was written. He said, I have seen my entire life before the most high, how it's been penned down by the hand of my creator. And so one thing that we do know is that there is nothing that happens that happens without the orchestration of the word of God. Matthew chapter, I mean, John chapter one, verse three says, by him all things were made and there was nothing made that was made without him. Everything is made by the word of God. And so when God is saying to us, for us to get a good grasp of what time we're in. Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> when I was praying for us this morning, oh, the Holy Spirit is such an orchestrator. When I was praying for us this morning, there were lots of things that were of my own that I brought before the Lord. But the Lord said to me, understanding is what is needed. The Lord said to me that understanding <clears throat> is what is what needed. We need to know the house of the spirit. Some people here try to trademark the expression how. Help us on watch. Yeah, but we all need to know. <clears throat> is it o'clock? Oh yeah, yeah, forget about what I said. Let's go back to the scriptures. We need to know the house of the spirit. The house, <laughs> what is wisdom? Wisdom answers the question why? Understanding answers the question how? And the Holy Spirit said to me that we need understanding. And how do we get understanding? The Bible says Daniel received understanding by books. From reading the written word, we receive what? Understanding. Okay, so praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm even producing more water than it's in this bottle in case you haven't noticed. God is good. So Isaiah 43, throw yourself into it. <clears throat> in fact, I want to do you a favor. Let me help you with an insight. And then we're going to read Matthew. <coughs> okay, maybe I actually need this water. Praise the Lord. You know, I always say that water is for mortals. <clears throat> so I don't know what's happening to me today <clears throat> alrighty excuse me here I may have to put some mint <clears throat> oh come on <clears throat> Jesus Christ <clears throat> be seated Alrighty, let's try this again, but then I'm going to be with this mint, so excuse my manners for a moment. What Matthew did I say we were going to read? 17. Matthew 17, and actually before we read Matthew 17, let us go to this Isaiah 43, and I'm going to show you verse 11. Verse 11 is kind of like a, a good preamble, if you would, for getting a good grasp of what the Lord is telling the church, are we good? About the time that we're in. Look at what it says. The Bible says here that I even, because the whole of Matthew, I mean of Isaiah 43, in some of these Bibles, my Bible for example, do you need me Bennett? It's titled, 
the Redeemer of Israel. The Redeemer of Israel. And we're getting to, we are in the time of the Redeemer. Right? When Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he came as the Savior. He came to pay the price. That's why I keep using the expression that we are kind of a lay away. So he paid the price, but he is yet to redeem us. And why is that so? The Bible says that as soon as they were about to get into Jerusalem, I believe this is Luke 17 or Luke 19, Jesus said to his disciples, as they were about to get into Jerusalem, he said to them, he says, let me tell you a story. He says there is a man who is royalty. He says he has engaged with the people that are meant to become his people. He said, however, he would leave them for a while to go to a far country. The message translation says to go to the headquarters to obtain authorization to establish his kingdom. So he's paid the price for us. However, he hasn't redeemed us yet because where would he take us if he redeemed us now? So that was why when he came, he paid the price, he empowered us, and he said to his disciples, therefore, because of the parable that he just told them, occupy till I come. So just keep yourselves busy till I come. Make disciples so that it's not just you. I'm not just coming back for you, you small people, small group of people. Hopefully, you guys can gather more. You understand what I mean? God is not always as concerned about quantity as he is quality. When he had 4,012 people, it bothered him because he recognized that of all the 4,012, only 12 of them were really there for him. The 4,000 were there for themselves. And that is still true till today. Almost anywhere that you go to and you find the multitude, they're not there for the cause, they're there for themselves. Anywhere you find the multitude, they are typically there for themselves. So when all the 4,000 left, he asked the 12 that remained, he says, will you also leave me? And they were like, <laughs> We have already left all to follow you. So if you haven't left all to follow Jesus in these days of the Redeemer, you will be very thoroughly tested. We are all being tested, but the ones who haven't left all will receive even more of a shaking because Satan is going around with a magnet. And that magnet is only going to draw you to him if you have his metals inside of you. The Bible says that Satan the prince of this world, he came to Jesus and found nothing in him. So Jesus could not stick to the, mount, to the magnet of Satan. That is why the Bible says that death could not hold him. Because there's nothing in him that they could connect to. So if you haven't left all to follow Jesus, if there is still some of the world in you, some desires to be this and that in the world. Let me tell you something, one of the metals of Satan. Okay, I think I've had enough of this thing now. Does anybody have like a little napkin so I can spit it out? So if you're just joining, I'm not just being completely mannerless. It's because of the cough. I had to use a little mint. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate that very greatly. God is good. So one of the metals of the enemy, one of the substances that Satan is using today to draw away many believers is ambition. Ambition looks very much like passion, like, like commitment, like dedication. In fact, I tell people that there is a thin line between the commission and ambition. Jesus says, this is the great commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of men. However, there are so many people who are out there preaching the gospel, not in response to the commission, but they're doing it out of their ambition so that they can have a title, so that they can have recognition, so that they can have a following, so that they can stop looking at one person holding the mic all the time and thinking, oh, why is it not my turn? Why is it not me? And that ambition is what Satan is using to continue to draw people into the world. Because ambition is not of God. Ambition is of the world. As a human being, God expects for you to have no ambition. Simply because like we read in Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23 that my wife read to us last, on Saturday, man was not made for himself. 
Ambition is when you are trying to become what you have chosen to become as opposed to surrendering yourself to the Lord to make you what he chooses. And many believe, many Christians are not aware of the fact that what they have is ambition rather than passion for souls. I've seen people who walk around like evangelists doing street witnessing, who go to places, who self-invite themselves to podiums because of souls. But when you break it down to what it is really, it is not the dedication to the kingdom as much as it is to satisfy the ambition that burns within them. You know what David said before the Lord after having been king for several years? He recognized that several kings that he had gone to battle against were kings not because they wanted to serve God by serving the people, but they were kings because they wanted to be lords over the people. And after having seen several of those, he went to the Lord and says, Father, please search me and know me. He said, search me through and through that if there be any wicked ways in me, please get it out. Show me so that I can take it out. Or you just completely help me take it out simply because if we are not careful, even some of the good intentions that we set out with can easily become ambition simply because whatever exists in this world, in this realm, is always subject to corruption. Even the love that you have for God can wax cold. You see what I mean? Even that fire that's been burning on your altar for praying and interceding can wax cold. And that is the reason why we have to make sure that our minds are constantly being renewed so that we do not suffer a deterioration of our godly passion into worldly ambition. Praise the Lord. And so we know that we were not made for ourselves, so we live for God. And so in the times that we're in, it is very critical for us to recognize that the Redeemer is coming. He did what? Save us. So he came as a Savior. But when he's coming back again, he's not coming back as the Savior. He's coming back as a King's man, Redeemer. He is coming to redeem us. And that is the reason why Isaiah 43 should become familiar to us. We need to get ourselves familiar with it. Why? Because if we do not know the Jesus that we're anticipating, he would come and we would not recognize that it is him. Every time that God has come to his people, there is always a good number of people that don't recognize that it is him. You know what Jacob says? Jacob was like, oosh, the Lord was here and I knew it not. Which is kind of strange because he was raised in a godly household. He needs to have known the ways of God. Well, you know, I've heard, you've heard me teach this before. You need to have a personal revelation of God on your own. You understand what I mean? And so we need to get ourselves familiar with the Savior that we are anticipating. When Jesus came the first time as the Savior, even though his name was called Yeshua, which means God, our salvation, many people still decided to interpret that salvation to be salvation from the Roman government because they thought that the Romans were the enemies. Whereas what Jesus came to save them from was what? Their sins and the angel of the Lord did not mean words. When angel Gabriel was giving them the instructions around the naming of Jesus, he said, and you shall call his name Jesus, which is Yeshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. But because of the ambition that these people had to be self-governing, the ambition that they had to be free from human authority, they were quite happy to remain blind to the authority of sin, which was even more deadly. And that was the reason why Jesus was not for them. He came to his own, the Bible says, and his own did not know him. So if you do not know the Jesus that you're anticipating as the redeeming Jesus, guess what? You may miss him completely. He may show up in the blue skies. Yes, you will see him, but you may not be able to take advantage of this second coming to the fullest if you do not know that it is coming as the king's man, redeemer. So we all need to get ourselves familiar with the redeemer in Isaiah 43. But look at what he says in verse 11. He says, I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me, there is no savior. Beside me, there is no savior. He says, I am. The same one that came to save you. But if you don't recognize that I have saved you and now I am coming to redeem you, 
you will miss it. I heard somebody say recently that if you are still looking to be saved after you've been saved, what you're doing is that you're trying to get into God by jumping backwards. Because he has already saved you, there is no further sacrifice for sin. So we need to put behind us the miserable elements of getting cleansed and begin to pursue righteousness in terms of maturity and godliness. Because he is coming for a group that is mature in the things of the kingdom. Because the kingdom is not going to be handed to the ones who are still servants in their minds. The Bible says that an offspring, while he is still a child, differs not from a servant. And such will not receive an inheritance. So for us to receive an inheritance, that means we need to be mature sons and daughters of God. And so this maturity is the key for understanding the way we need to compose ourselves in the times that we're in. Remember the, the, the stick that the angel of the Lord brought into this place a couple of minutes ago and how it started to spin. And he said, there are many people in the middle still wallowing in the blood, always looking for a cleansing when they should be in righteousness, in the white space, growing and maturing. You see, so if you don't know the Jesus that is coming back, you will be presenting him with your sins to save you from what he has already saved you from, whereas you're supposed to be anticipating presenting him with your works that you may receive a reward. You know, they always say that, the, uh, the, that average is the enemy. You know, they, they, I think there's a book titled The Enemy Called Average. They have average can be an enemy. But one enemy is not as bad as several enemies. Average is one enemy that just walks alone. But there is a group, a legion of enemies that are called familiar spirits. And we need to learn how to identify familiar spirits, how to identify mediums so that they do not present themselves as the savior or the redeemer before the king's man redeemer himself comes. The great deception is called the ministry of the Antichrist. The word anti, like I always tell you, is not against. It means in place of. So the Antichrist will come and pretend to be a savior. Why? Because he will come and do things that are familiar. Things that are expected. When Jesus came the first time, it was familiar spirits that prevented the scribes and the Pharisees from being able to harness the joy of his coming. Why? Because what they had been familiar with up until that time were saviors and judges that came with sword and spears. They had seen Joshua, who was the captain of the Lord's army here on earth. And they had seen people like Samson, who dealt with the enemy with the jawbone of an ass, of a donkey. You see, these are the things that they had seen. They had seen Gideon and his 300 men who went to battle in the physical. But when the time came for them to make the transition, guess what happens? There was an abortion of their transition. Simply because they were not ready initially to make that switch of first of all, opening their minds to know what they expect. And, the, and God already knew that that was going to be a problem. When Jesus came, one of the first things that he addressed, one of the first messages that Jesus preached was a message against familiarity. He said, what have you come to the wilderness to see? Have you come to see a reed that is shaken by the wind? He says, have you come to see the same things that you expect? He said, have you come to see one that is dressed in fine linen? He said, because the ones who are dressed in fine linen, they belong in the courts of the king. He said, but what exactly have you come to see? And the people could not answer because he already eliminated all of the options. All of the things that they would go to see, people like to see royalty. They like to see celebrities. The moment a celebrity came into town, they could no longer see. So people will go and wait on the outskirts of town in the wildernesses so that they can catch a glimpse of a prince that is coming to town. And that was the reason why they came to meet Jesus before he got to Jerusalem. Because once he got into Jerusalem, he was no longer accessible to the common man. On that particular trip, he was going to be standing before judges, before kings. So the common man went to meet him 
before he came into Jerusalem. It was the order of the day that people would go out with an expectation to see someone that they could not otherwise see. And sometimes people will go to the wilderness and when you get to the wilderness, if there's no royalty, what do you see? You just see the reed being shaken by the wind. That is what the people had become familiar with. And Jesus says, have you come to see the usual? And the moment he eliminated those two things, he asked them, what have you come to see? And everybody was like, oh, does anything else ever happen here in the wilderness? So he said to them, he says, open your eyes. Because what is in the wilderness today and in this season is the voice of him crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. You must know who he's coming. Because if you are expecting the familiar, your disappointment will be irrecoverable. You may not be able to recover from the disappointment. The Pharisees never did. They never recovered from the disappointment that Jesus would not bring out a long sword and, and deal with Caesar and all of his hosts. Because that was what they were familiar with. They were familiar with deliverance by force from men. But the Lord is saying now, I am no longer dealing with the symptoms of the problem. Do you know that people are only a symptom? People are never the problem. People are never the problem. That person that insulted your person is not the problem. It was sin that was operating in them that made them to speak guile against the Lord's anointed. Anyone who knows the workings of the things of the Spirit will recognize the magnitude and the severity of speaking against the Lord's anointed. The Bible says God himself speaking, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. And so, no harm. And so the person who is speaking against you does not know who you are, neither do they know who God is. So they are not the problem. It is their ignorance working in or sin working through ignorance that allows for people to present themselves as the problem. People are never the problem. God made man in his image and in his likeness. And God is not the problem. The Bible says God is not evil and he never tempts anyone with evil. So people are never the problem. The root of the problem is sin. So when Jesus came, they were expecting Jesus to bring a band-aid to apply to the symptom, which is, let him cut off the Romans. But what they did not ask themselves is this. Before the Romans, you were not free. You were bound in Egypt. You were lost in Babylon. So the fact that the title and the crest on the shield has changed, the fact that the color of the flag has changed does not make any difference. You're still dealing with symptoms. Let me use an example that many of us can relate to. Do you know that money is never the problem? The Bible says that money is not the problem. The love of money is not even the problem. <laughs> you see, many of us read this scripture that says the love of money is evil. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Things don't begin by having a root. They first of all exist and then they develop a root so that they can be locked in place. Right? So money is never the origin of the problem. The love of money is never the origin of the problem. The love of money is what sustains the problem. It is the root of all evil. You understand what I mean? So the person who becomes a thieving politician does not set out to become a thieving politician because of the love of money. The original problem is greed and ambition. But the moment he takes that little money that is stole from the local government, then the problem of greed begins to take root in his heart. And then that continues to feed the greed. Then he wants to go to the Senate. And from the Senate, he wants to go to the presidency. Why? Because this love of money is now taking root. So when Jesus came, familiar spirits possessed the people around him 
so that they started to expect the familiar. And what is the familiar? A savior or a judge that comes to deal with the symptoms. But the Bible says when he comes, it will be that time that's been prophesied that now the ax is laid to the root. A sin is that root. And so when Jesus came, they completely missed him. Because they were waiting for him to fight the symptoms. And Jesus says, how will I save you if I fight the symptoms? Everybody who came before me has been fighting the symptoms. I have come to actually deal with the root of the problem. And they were like, ah, no. Don't deal with the root. Don't kill the bacteria. Just reduce the fever. Say that again. Oh yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's witchcraft. That's why it's, it's, it's a function of familiar spirits. They just want to deal with the symptoms. Suppress the symptoms, but when the root cause is still there, that bacteria will wait for you to get well a little bit and then hit you harder. You understand what I mean? And so, when you look at the operation of familiar spirits, they are there to attempt to take the place of God in the life of a man. You know, one of the very first introductions that we see to familiar spirits operating in scripture is when King Saul went to Samuel and could not find him because the man of God had gone to be with the Lord. And so, because that was all he had been familiar with, right from his anointing and ordination as king, he has always gone to Samuel, or he had always gone to Samuel to hear from the Lord. But now the Lord has ordained for himself another prophet in the place of Samuel, but King Saul was stuck with the familiar. So the Bible says he went looking for a medium. A medium is essentially somebody who is working in congruence or in partnership with familiar spirits who can keep you in the past. They will recreate an experience that came originally from God, even though the cloud of God has already moved. And that was what the familiar, that was what the medium did. The medium conjured from the ground the soul and essence of Samuel. He just went back to the hard drive because the ground is the hard drive. The Bible says that the ground records everything that happens upon the face of the earth. And so he, the, he just, the, the medium literally went to the hard drive and replayed the soul of Samuel. And Saul was like, ooh, Shumba. Whereas God was no longer there. That wasn't God speaking because God has already moved. Familiar spirits know that you are made to be satisfied with nothing less than God. And so they will find an older version of a God encounter and keep you shrouded in that place. When Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration and he took Peter, James, and John with him and they saw Jesus being transfigured with Elijah and Moses, with Moses and Elijah, they were like, oh, shakalamba, let us build a tent for each one of y'all. And Jesus was like, no, 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 no. What you're doing is you want to invite familiar spirits. This, an ex this experience is just for now. You're not supposed to camp around here. You need to keep moving because even these Moses and Elijah that, they, uh, that have come, they have come to help me wage war. These are my witnesses. Because the disciples had yet to be activated. And so God had to import tested witnesses from heaven for the cross, for the crucifixion and resurrection. Because whenever Jesus is coming to do a work, he needs witnesses because it is absolutely illegal to operate on earth without two or three witnesses. And because there was nobody who was willing to go to that extent with him, he had to bring down soldiers from heaven that have already been tested. So he brought Moses and Elijah. And that is the reason why the Bible lets us know that before the second coming of the Lord Jesus, we will see two witnesses again, the two olive trees that are in the presence of the Lord, even the same two lampstands that are before the Almighty God. And they will be his witnesses as he returns. And so these people wanted to entrap that experience and the moment they did that, even though it is out of the goodness of their hearts and their passion for the things of God, it will create an ambience for the familiar spirits to come and dominate. 
Have you not seen the end of many revivals that we have gone to? A meeting that's supposed to be a three-day revival because 14 people out of 15 fell under the power of the Lord. Then they invite everybody in town and in the next town and then they start getting people flying in from Canada and other places and then they drag the revival for three weeks and by the time you get there, the third week, it is full of familiar spirits because the cloud of glory has already moved. Because when you, when you try to keep God in the form that you experienced him at the time of impartation or visitation, then what happens is you get yourself subject to familiar spirits because that is exactly what they want. They don't want you to move with the cloud. They want to trap you with something that looks like him. So we need to know the time that we have come to. We have come to the time of the Redeemer and so the Antichrist will come looking like the Savior. Because that is what we are so far familiar with. And we do not want to end up like the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. Because those guys were only willing to receive the familiar. Why is there so much the gospel of grace being preached today? The way that it is being preached. Because familiar spirits are out in the church. Keeping people trapped in the place of Jesus the Savior. And that keeps them from experiencing Jesus the Redeemer. I tell you again and again the way the gospel of grace has been preached in most places today. It has been preached in such a way that it lets you think that you can continue in sin that grace may abound because they tell you that, oh, the finished work of Christ, the finished work of Christ. Yes, there is a finished work of Christ, but when are you going to finish your work? He is not coming to reward his own work. He's coming to reward your own work. When are we going to bear the fruits? When are we going to work the works if we are still stuck with the beggarly elements of repentance. It is the work of familiar spirits and they are everywhere and they sound so sweet because that is their makeup. Do you know that the, origin, the original word for familiar spirit is the word of, which is the root word for father, for ava, because of the fact that they try to look like the father. There are two main words in the Bible that are mostly translated familiar. The other one is actually shalomi, which means the one that brings peace. So when David was speaking in Psalms 49, verse 10, he says, even the one that is my familiar friend has raised his heel that I may trip. And so they try to look like the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is your friend. He's the one that comforts you, that brings you peace. They try to look like the Father. They try to look like the Holy Spirit. And that is their mission so that you stop short of proceeding to receive the great visitation of the Redeemer. But Jesus says, but I alone am the Savior. And I've already come as the Savior. So when I'm coming again, I'm coming as the Redeemer. So if anybody comes and they tell you that they are the Savior, he says immediately you know that that is the Antichrist. If anybody says that they're going to save you from the decadence that is in the world, from the poverty that is in the world, we already know the platform that the Antichrist is going to be reigning on. It is the platform that has already been laid out by the ones with an abominable name, the United Nations, because they are trying to save us from the problems of the world. They want to end poverty in the world. They want to end sicknesses. They want to end all the decadence. But the Lord is saying, no, I already saved you from all of that. He says, I've already saved you from the corruption of sin. So everything can corrupt around you, but you have become the incorruptible seed of God. Let no one call themselves the Savior because only one is your Savior. And he says, it is I, even I, the I am. So in order for us to not be for, to not be caught in the whims and the caprice of the familiar spirits, we need to recognize what the unfamiliar is. When Jesus comes, he's coming in such an unprecedented way because he has never come to redeem us before. That is the reason why when he came, when he's coming, he says, behold, I am coming and I will make all things new. He also said, behold, I do a new thing and will you not know it? And so if he's coming to do a new thing, I need to recognize what that new thing looks like so that nobody fools me with some gimmickry in the name of God. May we not end up like Saul who was king by a fresh word from the Lord but wanted to retain his position as king 
by going to a replay of messages that are completely elapsed as far as the mission of God is concerned. I want to encourage you folks. The Bible says that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter is there as a memento of a manifestation of the spirit at some particular point. So you need to look at the letter so that you understand the nature of the things of the spirit. But by all means, don't stick with what the letter says. Go and receive the rima, the spoken word of God, a revelation of what God is saying in the now. And so if you don't know what God is saying now, you are already attending the church of familiar spirits. If you don't know what God is saying now, you're sitting, or if anybody says that they are teaching and preaching today and they do not tell you what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. The Bible says it is by a heart of understanding that we will discern what the Lord is saying unto his church. So we need that understanding. And that understanding begins by us looking at prophecy and recognizing. Let me give you two attributes of the Redeemer. So that you know what you're looking for because the antidote to not falling for what you should avoid is to know what you should approach. You know, they say that pilots are never told what to avoid. They're always told what to approach. And so if there's a mountain and the pilot is flying very close to the peak of the mountain, they don't tell the pilot, oh, avoid the peak of that mountain. Because they say seven times out of ten, the pilot ends up flying in two because the last thing he heard was the mountain. So they tell him, fly east into the clear skies and that's where he goes and so to avoid the mountain you need to recognize what you should be approaching and look at these attributes of the redeemer now look at what he says he says in verse 3 for I am the Lord your God if I let's start reading from verse 2 when you pass through the waters I will be with you and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Nor shall the flame scorch you. What is the Lord Jesus telling us? He's preparing us for glory. So he says, what you totally and absolutely need to anticipate is that you will come into waters that will almost drown you. If you are not walking a path in this life today, wherein you feel overwhelmed, you are with familiar spirits. Familiar spirits have one mission. They want to pacify you. Do you know that another expression for familiar spirit is the ones that bring comfort? You understand what I mean? But the Holy Spirit is your only true friend. He's your only comforter. But familiar spirits want to bring you comfort. How do they operate today? They operate today by teaching you that money is coming. Every encouragement is about anticipating money. And safe money is the currency of heaven. But people, when they hear, oh, that money is coming. Oh, five principles from the book of Josiah. How you are going to get money in this season. Before December, you will get money. And you know people feel comforted because they're like, yeah, money is coming. But the Bible did not say the just shall live by money. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Familiar spirits want to make you feel comfortable when there is no true comfort. So they keep telling you the waters are not coming. The waters of the flood have already come. Yeah, the Lord is not saying here that he's going to flood the earth again. He said, but you, as part of your trials, you will be flooded. And if you do not know me, you will be drowned. He said, but the only way you will not drown is if you know how to find me in that water. Because if you find me in that water, I will be your stay. He says, they will not treat you kindly. In fact, if anything at all, they will throw you into the fire. You know, I've told you before, the Bible says that as Abraham was, so shall his descendants be. Abraham was thrown into the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were thrown into the fire. And Jesus is saying, you're next. Jesus himself was thrown into the fire. The Bible says, haven't gone deep down into hell. The Bible did not say that he passed 
over hell. He went deep down into hell to spoil principalities and powers. If Jesus went through the fire, Abraham went through the fire, the three Hebrew children went through the fire. If you are not going through the fire of persecution and isolation in this world, then you are walking with familiar spirits who are shielding you from the true test and preparation of the Lord. Familiar spirits are the ones that offer to help you lift your weight at the gym so that you do not grow any muscle. They're like, oh, come on, Rosemary. You don't want to carry that. It's too heavy. We'll help you. But if Rosemary doesn't carry that burden, how would Rosemary develop muscle? And that is the reason why a lot of messages that have been preached from podiums today are messages that tell people, don't worry, be happy. Whereas Jesus says, in the world, you will have tribulations and trials. He says, but don't worry. The moment you find me, you have peace. So if I have peace without having found him, then it is false peace. So the attribute of the Redeemer is that when the time for redemption comes, you will be tried by fire, but the Redeemer will be there close enough for you to find him and to lay hold of him. He is telling you here that I am not coming to keep you from trials, but I am coming to stand with you in trials. There is a huge difference. So let us rejoice once again in tribulations, ladies and gentlemen, because to not rejoice in tribulations or to avoid tribulations is what? Is to continue to be in the fellowship of familiar spirits. You know, the familiar spirits, what they do is they tell you to come and walk in a place that is already paved. Whereas God said that his angels are watching over you so you don't dash your foot against the stone because he knows he's sending you to a very rocky place. So if you are walking in a place and there are no stones, please phone home. Ask God to come and deliver you from familiar spirits. Many of us have been in places. We've, been, we've served in ministries wherein familiar spirits came and they took over. And every action and every activity had to be bought buttery smooth. If, you, if it has any sound of trial or tribulation, they shut it down. Fellowship that is supposed to be a time of intercession is called the party. And so when people are coming, oh, I'm going for this party. And so when you think you're going to a party, would you expect to fight when you get there? No, because familiar spirits have already set the table before you so that you do not experience the Redeemer. But thank God, the one who rescued us out of the pit of hell, he is not done rescuing us from places wherein we would not truly experience the company of innumerable angels, wherein we would have been lost in the midst of the voices of familiar spirits. The Bible says, beware of dogs. Yeah, because, they, you know, they say the dog is your best friend. Nothing can be further from the truth. The dogs, from the Bible perspective, are the ones who look like they are your friends, but they are ready to bite you at any time. The Bible says, where is that scripture again? We were reading it. My wife and I were reading that scripture recently. It was our meditation scripture for just yesterday, Rosemary. I didn't tell you where it is. I must have told you. In fact, I'm going to tell you all here. I think it's, I think it, I think it's in Philippians, but let's look, let's look for it together. Beware of dogs. Because the Bible tells you exactly what dogs do. Philippians 3, 2. There you go. Do you have a dog? You got there so quickly. Yeah. Beware. The Bible says beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of mutilation. Mutilation. What they're supposed to do is that at the end of the day, they want to bite you, but they come in looking like friends. Dogs are familiar spirits. Psalm chapter 49 verse 10. David said the same people who raised their heel for me to stumble. They came in as friends. Psalm, Psalms what? 41 verse 9. What did I say? I said 49 verse 10. It's still the same 4, 1 and 9. Oh no, you're welcome. So what did you say again? It's Psalms 41 verse 9. Oh yeah, yeah. Please. You know sometimes num it's a numbers game, right? Yeah, but again, I'm going home to a nice dinner tonight because when my wife is right, everything is right. Yeah. I would rather be wrong for you to be right, baby. 
baby, 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 be right, baby, be right, baby. Praise the Lord. Alrighty, you know, my wife read it somewhere that everybody has five minutes of madness in every 24 hours. I think that was two minutes out of my five. <laughs> Praise God. And so let's keep going. It says here, it says you shall pass through the flame and it will not scorch you. For I am the Lord your God. Verse 3 of, of Isaiah 43, verse 3. Okay, the Lord says, I shall let you go and find the rest. Oh yeah, because he's already there. Everything you need to know about the Redeemer. At least to get you started. So that your heart is very aware of who to anticipate so that you do not fall into the error of familiar spirits. Familiar spirits are there to do exactly what their name says. One of the things that the Lord actually started to talk to me about today, about familiar spirits was this. He says some of your brothers and sisters, he says they are still going through what I recently rebuked you over concerning the familiar. He said many of us have experienced certain miracles in the past. And now we have similar needs again in our lives and we expect that God will show up exactly the way he showed up the last time. And God is saying, that's not what I do. Behold, I do a new thing. You understand what I mean? The last time you were quarreling with someone, what God told you to do was to pray for them and you prayed for them and they called you. And you were like, I've just been praying for you. And they're like, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have treated you like that. And this time around, you are loggerheads with somebody and you're like, I'm just going to go pray for them. No, the Lord is saying, no, this time around, I'm asking you to go to them. And you're like, oh, that must not be God because the last time God told me to pray. So what are you doing? You are now giving heed to familiar spirits because it doesn't have to happen the way it did the last time. Even though he's God and he changes not, yet he does new things. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. It didn't say his mercies are the same every morning. They are new every morning. And that is the reason why we wake up sometimes and we feel merciless because of the fact that we have not renewed our minds to accept that which is new. Jesus says, who dares to put old, I mean, new wine into old wine skin? You will destroy both. So I'm bringing the new wine. You bring the new wine skin. I'm bringing new mercies. You bring a new perspective. Be ready to see me in a light that you haven't seen me because the cloud of God's glory is not the stone or the pillar of his glory. Pillars are the same every time, but clouds do not take the same form twice. Remove yourself from the familiar. Because God is ready to do a new thing. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be so new. One of the things that I've been most concerned about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, I've shared this with some of you before, is the fact that even myself, I am being mindful not to miss him when he comes. Because it's going to be totally different. It will be totally, totally different. And he warned us. He says, behold, I do something new. My brother was reminding me yesterday of a, of a, of a, of a prophet that came to our church in 1989. 87 or 89, he said when he came, he was preaching in the local language and someone was translating for him in English. And you know this man was describing TikTok in 1987. He said the time is coming wherein immorality will be made accessible to all and everyone who sees will cheer on the ones who are performing the entertaining acts of immorality. Is that not what is going on today? The worse, the more you do foolish things, the more your posts are seen. I am preaching by the grace of God what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. And sometimes it's only Josephine and Rosemary that likes my reel. I saw a video on Instagram the other day and the Instagram video, the guy says, for the 12 people that keep liking my post, I'm going to the gas station. Do you need anything? I'm like, wow, I need to give these two and Anne and Ryan a Christmas present because those are the people. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, on several occasions, I would tell my wife, I'd be like, do people even know that this is what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches? But if I can just go and get Photoshop to put some six pack in here and take off my shirt, 
they'll be coming and they'll be liking and commenting and, and fighting each other about the fact that it's not six pack, that it's actually eight. You know, because people want to discuss and debate foolishness. And nobody wants to go near the truth in the times that we're in. It's not all bad news because you know what that means is there's plenty of room for you around the truth. Let them become, let them continue to be foolish. That was what Jesus said. Not my words. I'm not mean. Okay, sometimes I sound mean, but I'm not. Jesus said it. He says, let the ones who are foolish remain foolish still. Let the ones who are without understanding remain understanding, remain without understanding still. He says, seeing, they will see. But they will not comprehend what they're looking at. He says, listening, they will listen, but they will not hear. And so we know that it is the lot of the ones who have continued to harbor the world within them without giving up everything to follow him. But you who's giving up everything to follow him, you should allow yourself to suck the breast of the El Shaddai. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You are the almighty orchestrator. Because this was what the Holy Spirit said to me while worship was on. The reason why I was so excited even though when I'm excited sometimes in the spirit I'm crying and you think I'm sad. Because sometimes the things of the spirit are completely backwards. Right? So when you see me there, <laughs> I'm actually back flipping and moonwalking before the Lord. You understand what I mean? And what he showed to me was this. I saw the good shepherd and he was calling to his herd, to his flock. He says, come and graze. As we were in worship, the Lord says, come and graze. And that just broke me. Because there's no better way to describe love than what I just saw. When the good shepherd was calling us to come and graze. And this is not artificial turf like we have in our house. This is real grass. And it's so green and luscious. And then I remembered when David says, He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You see, the Lord is taking you to a place where you can graze and where you can be fed. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And the Lord is saying, come and graze. Come and graze. What he brought before us to today is an experience wherein he has brought us to his meadow to come and graze and be fed. I was hoping that you would rejoice. Now let me bust your bubble. You know me. I like to set test. It's a setup. It's a holy setup. Yeah, because I was set up too. When I saw him say come and grace, I was excited. And they said for the journey that is ahead. And he was like, oh my God. That's why the cattle has three stomachs. You understand what I mean? You need to have three stomachs. One of them has to be memory. One of them has to be inspiration and the other one has to be knowledge. You need to carry everything along with you. Do not forget his benefits. But let your spirit remain activated to be inspired by the Lord. For the Bible says there is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. And the other one is knowledge. He says fill yourself with the knowledge of my word daily. Daily. Fill yourself with the knowledge of the word of God. You are a cattle before the Lord with those three compartments in your stomach so that even if the journey before you, before you get to another destination is long, you will continue to ruminate on that which you have fed yourself with in the time that we're in. I encourage you by the mercies of God, fill yourself up now while you can. The Lord is inviting you to come in grace. But the beauty of it all, and now we're, gonna, we're ready to break the bread now. The beauty of it all is that the Lord is letting us know that we need to fill ourselves with the understanding of the times that we're in. So that when the Lord comes, we don't miss him. I, I say it and I mean it. I don't want to assume that I know what the second return of the Lord Jesus will look like. It's one of the things that I have studied the most in my life. And I keep studying it. Because the Bible says it is the glory of God to conceal the matter. The glory of kings to search it out. If God has decided to make it a mystery, then who am I to complain? I can't just say, oh, I know the wicked master that you are. Here is your little penny that you gave me. Take it back. Many of us are like that. We're like, if God decided to make revelation complicated, then let him just read his own revelation because I'm not bothering myself no more. And the Lord is saying, what is the fun in that? I made it fun by concealing stuff so that when you finally get it, it'll be worth your while. Did you, get, did you get what I just said? God does it so. I mean, just imagine if gold was lying all over the place, it's not going to have any value. 
But when you have been digging and digging, and after two years, you finally find something that looks like gold. Even if it's just an ounce, you will shout, ah! simply because you have sought for a while to find it. The value is in the search. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. So we're going to be landing the plane on this note. Um, I have sought the Lord concerning you and I have been given the license to show you one more thing from Isaiah 43. I'm not really going to show you. I'm just going to mention it. If it clicks, it clicks. And if it doesn't, you catch it when you get home so that we don't preach another sermon. Now, but I pray that he clicks. So you see verse 7 of this Isaiah 43. It's a very critical one. It's like when you're, when you're forming a picture from a puzzle set. You know that one that once you get it, then you know where everything else around it goes? Look at what it says. He says, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. He says, everyone that is created for my glory. When I was praying this morning for understanding, for my brothers and sisters, as the Lord laid it upon my heart, this was what the Lord showed to me. He said to me, he says, let me help you so that you can help them. And the Lord said to me as I was looking out the window, almost as if I was waiting to see the Lord show up, he said this to me. He said, all things work together for good to those who love me and the ones that have been called according to my purpose. He says, if I haven't called you according to my purpose, then there is no need to even worry yourself. Just have fun and go wherever that leads. He said, but if I have called you according to my glory, he says, then you do not have to worry about it because I will form you into that image that carries my glory. Let me say that again in case you have not heard it. You see, what we need to concern ourselves with, and this is where the finished work of Christ comes to bear, is concern yourself with what God has chosen to do with you as opposed to what you can do with yourself. We have self-driving cars now, but what's the point of being able to drive yourself when you do not have a destination of purpose? The reason why I enjoy driving is because I enjoy going to places because I have purposes to fulfill in the places that I go. And that is what gives my driving a meaning. And God is saying, what gives your life a meaning is knowing that I have formed you. Being able to trust in his process and surrender completely to him is what creates the structure of understanding in the heart of a man. And by so doing, you are able to appropriate every experience that the Lord takes you through. So I want you to take that with you. Go and ruminate on it because the Lord is saying that if I have called you, I will form you. The Bible says whom he did call, he, whom he did for no, he predestined. Whom he predestined, he called. And the ones that he called, he justified. He says, it's not in your hands. It is in my hands. I just need you to pay attention and stand still and let me do my work. Stop running from pillar to post. Stop chasing shadows. Stop trying to go back in the past. He says, because when you go back in the past, you become dry and crusty in my hands because a clay that has been around for too long becomes dry and crusty. And that's what familiar spirits want you to do. They want you to be stuck in yesterday. A clay of yesterday that I'm trying to walk on today is already dry and crusted. The Lord is saying, move with the cloud. Be flexible. Be expectant of my workings. The Bible says the, the wind blows where it wishes. So is anyone that is led by the Spirit. Don't expect me to move like I moved yesterday. If you prayed for five minutes yesterday and you heard me speak, don't stop at four minutes and 59 seconds and say, okay now, speak God for your servant is listening. Because after five minutes, I'm gone out of here. And God is like, see you later. Because you don't call the shorts. I mean, you don't call the shots. So here we go. The Lord is saying, whom I have created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Everyone that is called according to his purpose will be made by him. And that is the reason why familiar spirits are all over the social media talking about self-made people. There are no self-made people. It's only one of those lies of familiar spirit. 
You know, they keep showing you self-made millionaire. And one day you're like, oh my God, when am I going to be like that? You do not want to be like that. It is all self-made foolishness because it is the fool that says in his heart that there is no God. If he is God, let him make you because he is the creator. Okay, I'm going to tell you this one because I think I'm making it too easy. What exactly this scripture addresses for the most part is the familiar spirit legion of ambition. You know, we started with ambition. How many people have been drawn away by Satan because of the ambition of their heart? And how did I define ambition to you? Ambition is, is, the, is the posture of a man's heart that seeks to become what he has chosen. That is ambition. But to be in submission to the Lord, you need to recognize that you can only become and should only become what he wants to make you. If you understand this, every ounce of ambition within you that familiar spirits are looking to prey upon will disappear. So when they come to you, they will find nothing in you. When familiar spirits come to me, they will find nothing in me because I keep working on reducing my ambition to zero. Sometimes I get restless, I get agitated. I want to go and invent something. I want to go and start another company. I want to do this and that. But I have come to recognize that unless the Lord moves, Moses told the Lord, he said, I led the people very well yesterday. In fact, they applauded me. But I'm not going to try to lead them today unless I see you move. He says, if your cloud of glory does not move, we're not going anywhere. That is exactly the kind of life that God wants us to live. God wants us to resign from the control seat and let God be God. Let God be God. Alrighty, we're going to break bread on that note. Uh, if I'm Matthew 27, 3, it's a very good one to break bread with. We've attempted that before. Let's do it again. Matthew 27, verse 3. One of my favorites. The Bible says, And Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. As we break bread today, tell yourself that part of sub, as part of submitting myself to the Lord is to not to try and undo the ambition that is within me by myself. He got into that situation because of his ambition. But he was trying to undo the ambition by being remorseful and taking the money back. But it was too late because remorse is not the key. Repentance is the key. And so tell yourself, I'm not going to be like Judas who was trying to undo the ambition. Tell the Lord Jesus, I may have been ambitious, I may have some ambition within me, but even trying to undo it is still being in the control seat. You, search me. And if there's any wicked wing in me, examine my heart and cleanse me. Renew within me, as David said, the right spirit. He says, create in me a clean heart of God and renew the right spirit within me. And if there be any wicked ways in me, examine my heart. Purge me with his soap and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. The Lord is not looking for remorse. He's looking for repentance. David says the sacrifices of God, they are not bulls or, 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 or animals. He said the sacrifices of God, they are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. A heart that is saying, I resign. Lord, fix this. So as we break bread today, I want you to just lay hold of the power that is in remembrance. Jesus says as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. This is the body of the Lord Jesus that was broken for you. As you eat of it today, eat unto life and wholeness in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Elekum yalakum. Alekum e yalakum. Jandea makum. Zabea makum. Zim kayam jumdaladi. So krandos to yaladi. Skumada loops telekust iande. In many ways, the Lord will reveal to you the perfect plan that He has for you. He says, I will let you know that I am the one that perfect all that concerns you. I have come today to help your confidence, says God. So that when you see that the thoughts that I have for you, they're not of evil, but of good to give you a future and a hope and to bring you to an expected end, your heart will be willing 
to surrender to me, says the Lord. Your heart will be ready to surrender to me. Yelukum is askums yelukum. Yal yelukum is askum yalakum. The perfect plan that I have for you is what will bring you perfect peace. Yelukum shalakum skantum de Allah. Is yesh o hai zum hai jabi zum ja yihas kumba hadia. Ula tums ai shumdala baburubala obios abakum skaida gum. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Rest in his goodness. For faithful is he who has called, who will also do it. The Lord has permitted me to stand upon the side of his holy hills and called my attention from the midst of the cherubim and allowed me to hear the song of their bowing down as they say, faithful is he who has promised. Faithful is he who has promised. I bring you glad tidings today from around the altar to say that your eyes will open and you will behold the goodness of the Lord that your heart may surrender fully to the Almighty God and let him have his way in you. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of your holy hills. In the mighty name of Jesus, let us drink the blood of the Lamb. This is the blood of the altar, the blood of sprinkling that cleanses. Hallelujah. I said to my wife this morning, I said, sometimes all I ask is to see Christ in you, the hope of glory. I was in great intercession today. My heart was troubled. I told my wife, I said, for three nights, too intensely, my heart's been troubled. I said, and I've been trying to narrow down what it is. And then it became apparent that my heart is troubled for the ones in whom I have yet to see progress. And after she left the room, the Lord spoke to me. He said to me, he says, you keep doing what you do and let me do what I do. The Lord is bringing about a great transformation. You see, shalakum yalakum, the Lord is saying that through his perfect plan, you will surrender to the potter and let him form you. You need to quit struggling because what you're doing is you are just muddying the water. He says, be still and you will see my salvation. Oh, la la kumaro ya la sindele ya ho. Hom kaye ya si ya la ho. Mamboru si ye ma. Lom za ye ya la ho. This is the time for you to just graze. Let your soul be fed before the Lord. Halekum das tu kum te skandole keli karum tu skuyela makum skieladom kromakalia is kindele dari kedaba. The Lord is good. He said, "I have amongst you today the unction of Isaiah." He says, "You will see. Your eyes will be open." Makum tu stelia grace. You see, because the Lord has not brought you here just for you. Oh yeah, the Lord has brought you here so that nations will come out of you. You know when, the, my, when my brother told me about this prophet that came, I was still too young to remember any of it. 1987. He said to me, I mean, what I said to him after he told me what the prophet said about the fact that he told everybody, my brother remembered it. In fact, I could see the look in his eyes of the presence of the Holy Spirit bringing to his remembrance. He says, this prophet said, that the world is going to change very significantly before Jesus comes. That the things that I say to you concerning the end, you cannot comprehend it now. He says there will be means 
for men all over the world to see the immorality that men are doing in secret. When he said that to me, I told my brother, I said, you know, there's something called OnlyFans. He says, no. I said, well, somebody came to report of their child making so much money and they investigated and they found out that that was what the girl was doing. So when they brought it to us, they brought it to myself and John's attention and we looked into the matter and we found out that that was what she has been on. And so it turns out to be that there are platforms now in the world wherein people can access immoralities that others are doing. This man prophesied it in 1987, a man without much formal education. They couldn't even speak much English. They had to translate for him. When my brother said that to me, you know what I said to him? I said to him, I said, where is the man now? He said oh, the guy was really old. He was probably like 70 something years old at the time. And my next observation was, I said, I do not remember the man coming, but I remember that our church at the time had just a few people. There weren't many of us. In fact, eventually, the reason why we left, we left because there just weren't many people. I kept saying that there were not enough people. I told, I told my brother, I said there are not enough children in Sunday school, at children's church, for me to play with. So we have to find another church. And we did. But look at what we left behind. And this is what happens when God is moving. It is not usually the most obvious kind of manifestation. The Bible says that the things of God are spiritually discerned. If they are very obvious, it is not God. God is not Captain Obvious. His name is the invisible God. So I want you to hold fast to your heart the things that are being said here because this is the way God operates so that you can then take this to the world. Father, we demand the name of Jesus. We thank you for yet another moment of learning at your feet. Thank you because of ourselves we can do nothing. But it is in you that we live and we move and we have our being. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is good. Let's be seated for two more minutes and we're just going to wrap this up. Please do not forget to get yourself in Isaiah chapter 43 and meditate on it. I'm going to remind you of something that I read today somewhere. Somebody said, don't allow the deceivers to make a fan out of you so that you become an enemy of the called ones. You see, the deceivers are out there making you feel like they are the good guys. And they are painting bad the good guys. What happens in that case, you end up being friends of the hypocrites and you make yourself enemies of the apostles, the ones that have been sent. Look at how many brethren we have lost in the body of Christ to such. They have taken us for the enemy. They take us for the, for the losers. They said that we are the ones that don't know what we're doing. Whereas it's because they fell for the lies of the enemy. And now they're out there chasing trends and chasing shadows. We pray for them. But in this season, our assignment is to stay at the feet of Jesus. Like Mary. As we continue to glean. So I want to encourage you. Rejoice and be glad. Because great shall be your reward. In Jesus name. The offering and other announcements are going to be scrolling on there. I want you to avail yourself the privilege of being able to honor the Lord with your substance. And I can't stress this enough. Please, know your season so that you do not miss your visitation. Isn't it amazing that the Lord will tell us, oh ha, where to find the attributes of the times that we're in. We looked at about three attributes right now from Isaiah 43. And it's not a hundred, a hundred verses. It's probably about maybe 30 verses. So it's easy for you to go and soak yourself in it. And let the Holy Spirit school you in your closet so that this inspiration can be very native to your own spirit. Make it your own. Let it be a personal revelation in the mighty name of Jesus. So uh, we're going to just pray over the offering real quick. In fact, I want you to pray over your seed today. Or just open your mouth and pray. And just thank God because he's the one that gives. And he's the one that also receives of us a token of our appreciation in worship so just pray over it 
in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you're still preparing yours, just pray over your heart that your hand will not be short toward the Lord. And again, only give as you are proposed in your heart. Not grudgingly, nor of necessity. Be led. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Do it with confidence in your heart, with full persuasion that you are actually giving unto the Lord as he leads in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All righty. Red Rose, do you want to say something about the conference or do you want to do that on Saturday? Totally up to you. Oh, you take care of it. Praise the Lord. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming. Pastor, we want you to stay right there. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Ah, 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 ah. How many know it's the man of God's birthday tomorrow? Hey! Let us all stand in the spirit of thanksgiving that's been here. We give God praise for the prophet that the Lord has placed before us. And if the minstrels, if y'all can flow with us, we're going to sing happy birthday. Come on. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor Moses. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Amen. And family, oh yeah, real quick, real quick before he comes down, let's take just about 30 seconds to pray in the spirit. Let's, let's lift this one up. Father, we give you praise because the Holy Spirit has made perfect intercession in behalf of this one. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. Amen. Amen.